Welcome back to Cardinalities.org. Today we are going to be continuing with our series, You Can't Handle the Truth. And in this video we'll be combining that series with dumbfounding definitions, dizzying distinctions, and diabolical doctrines. A series sorting through some of the jargon of philosophy to answer the question, what is Pino arithmetic? As we move deeper into our study of truth, we are going to need formal languages to work with, and these formal languages may need to be a little bit more expressive than languages we've worked with before. So as we move towards our axiomatic theories of truth, we are going to need to have a bit of an understanding of what Pino arithmetic is. Now, Logic and math are two of the most important deductive systems that we use. Because they're so similar, many attempts have been made to reduce various elements of math to logic. A simple version of this is known as Pino arithmetic. It is a set of logical rules which can be used to express the properties and operations of natural numbers. Remember, natural numbers are whole numbers and zero. So they are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. There's an infinite number of natural numbers. Things that aren't natural numbers are things like negative 5, 1 half, or the square root of 2. Now, Pino arithmetic is defined by five famous Pino postulates or axioms, which, when assumed, define the natural numbers. There are also some new symbols that we're going to need to include, as well as some new definitions of operations. But before we get to all of that, there's a big concept which kind of underlies all of Pino arithmetic and is very important in understanding the way in which we define numbers through Pino arithmetic. And it's the difference between a recursive definition and an explicit definition. So an important concept that will reappear throughout this video is the concept of recursion. Basically, there are two ways that we can define a pattern, recursively and explicitly. A recursive definition tells you about the first member of a pattern and then tells you how to get from one member to the next. An explicit definition tells you exactly how to get any particular member of a pattern. So the recursive definition explains the pattern by talking about the first member and then saying how to get to the next member and then how to get to the next member and the next member and so on and so forth. Whereas an explicit definition will tell you exactly how to get to a particular member. So imagine a pattern of brick stacks. We can explain this pattern either by saying the first stack has one brick and each following stack has one more than the last, recursively. Or we can say that any stack has the same number of bricks as its place in the pattern. For example, the third stack has three bricks, defining it explicitly. Pino arithmetic defines natural numbers recursively. It's important to note that you can find out how many bricks are in the fourth stack either way either by looking at the recursive pattern or the recursive definition and saying, well, the first stack has one, the second has two, because it has one more than the, one, the first. The third stack has one more than the second, so it has three. And the fourth stack has one more than the third, so it has four. Or you can define it and look at it explicitly to figure out how many bricks are in the fourth stack by saying it's fourth in line, so there are four bricks. Pino arithmetic is going to define natural numbers recursively. So for all of our definitions, we're going to need that starting point and the rule that gets from any member of the series to the next member. Now, before we get to the more in-depth explanation of Pino arithmetic, we're going to do a quick refresher for anyone that is kind of a little bit familiar with these ideas already. The rest of the video will explain how these postulates are used more in depth, how we can use them in conjunction with formal logic, and how they can be used to do proofs and how specific statements about numbers can be expressed with Pino arithmetic and with our logical structure. If you are confused by this summary, don't worry. We will explain the concepts in much greater depth as we go. It's important to note that 
these specific postulates only work when you already have a bit of a framework of logic and understanding, particularly of universal existential quantifiers, but also things like identity and implication. If you don't know what those things are, or if you're unaware of them, I highly recommend that you check out the 100 Days of Logic, where we go into a great deal of depth on every single issue presented in Basic Logic 101. But if you're already familiar with that, let's get started. So, here's the short version. The five penal postulates are zero is a natural number. As I said, we're defining this recursively. That's our starting point. Zero is a natural number. Number two, the successor of any natural number is a natural number. That's our rule that gets from any one number to the next number. The successor of any natural number, so the successor of zero is one. So one is also a natural number. The successor of one is two, so two is also a natural number, and so on and so forth. Number three, zero has no predecessor. We already knew that zero was a natural number, or we're told at least that zero was a natural number. This postulate is telling us that zero has no predecessor. Zero is the first natural number. So there does not exist a single natural number whose successor is zero. Number four, different natural numbers have different successors. Basically, this is saying that our stream does not branch. You don't have any branches going backward or forward. You have no numbers who have a single number that has two different successors or two different numbers that have the same successor. There are no branches. It's a single straight line on our number line. And number five, or the principle of mathematical induction, if zero has a property and if any natural number has that property, then its successor must also have that property. Then all natural numbers must have that property. Many of these postulates are confusing. Do not worry, we will touch on them more later. Now, we also have axioms of addition and multiplication. So the axioms of addition are, once again, thinking about recursive. We're going to talk about the first element of our series and how we get from one to another. So the first one is any number plus zero is that number, a pretty intuitive rule about addition. And then the second one, a little bit more complicated, any number plus the successor of any other number equals the successor of the sum of those two numbers. We'll explain that in more detail later. The axioms of multiplication also are very similar. Any number times zero is zero, once again, explaining how the first element of the series interacts with this new operation. And then, any number times the successor of any other number equals the product of the two numbers plus the first number. Hopefully, if that doesn't make sense, you will follow along and we'll go into more depth and demonstrate how all of these axioms can be applied and represented in formal logic. So. There are four new symbols and one new set of variables that we will introduce in order to understand Peano arithmetic. These will be ways of defining and representing specific natural numbers logically. The four new symbols are zero, successorship, addition, and multiplication. We will also use two variables, n and m, and in certain proofs we may also add a, b, and c if need be. A lot of times, formally, you'll see this represented as n, and then they'll just do n prime, putting like a little dash above m to get the second one, and so on and so forth. We're going to use different letters because it's easier to see and it's clearer. And these are all going to represent non-specific numbers. Note, these variables in this case are not representing propositions, which have a truth value. They are representing numbers, specifically non-specific natural numbers. Okay? You'll also notice in our alphabet, once again, the theme of recursion reoccurs. We have, instead of defining every single number separately, we have zero, our first term defined, and we have the term that's going to get us from one to the next, the idea of successorship. And we'll see how these are applied right now. So, the way that we will represent numbers will be as follows. Zero will be represented simply by the symbol zero. One will be represented by S zero, literally the successor of zero. Two will be represented by S, S zero, and so on, the successor of one or two. 
or the successor of the successor of 0. In longer formulas, I may abbreviate 2 as SS0, just getting rid of that extra pair of parentheses, 3 as SSS0, and so on and so forth. Hopefully, that is clear. Now, the successorship relation can also work over variables which stand for natural numbers, such as n and m. Similarly, in longer formulas, the number 2 might after n, so the number 2 after n, not n successor, but the successor of n successor, might be abbreviated as s, s, n, instead of using the extra parentheses. But basically, s, n is going to be the number after n, and s, s, m is the number 2 after m, not the number directly after m, but the number 2 after m. Now, we will also add two new operations, but these operations should be very intuitive to anyone that has a basic understanding of mathematics. They're going to be addition and multiplication. However, it's important to note that because we haven't defined these operations yet, you're not allowed to use them in the standard ways that we would expect them. We haven't shown a way that you can prove that 1 plus 2 actually equals 3, or 0 times 2 actually equals 0. We're going to need rules to logically prove those statements. You can't just assume that they work because you already have an understanding of the way that you would expect addition and multiplication to work. Now, in order to define what are and what are not natural numbers, we will need some axioms or postulates to help us out. We will be looking at the five famous Pino postulates, and then we will look at some additional axioms which can help us define multiplication and addition. The first Pino postulate is that zero is a natural number. If we take n as a variable which only stands for natural numbers, then we can write this as follows. There exists some n, some natural number, such that zero is identical to that n. We need this axiom to get started. As we talked about with recursion, you need a starting place. So Pino, as we've mentioned, is going to define the natural numbers recursively. This means we need a starting point and a rule to get from one to the next. In the same way, I could define the pattern 2, 4, 6, 8 as starts with 2 and then add 2 to get to the next number. Or I could define the pattern po, 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 po as starts with po, and then adds a po to the end to get the next string. Contrast this with defining these patterns as all positive even numbers, or all strings of only the letters p and o, where they each occur an equal and positive number of times, and no letter is adjacent to a token of itself. These would be kind of more explicit or general definitions, and they're definitely not recursive definitions. Our general way that we define natural numbers is by saying whole numbers in zero, or by giving that general rule, not by recursively defining them. Pino arithmetic is going to define these numbers recursively. This axiom is the starting place. Zero is the first natural number. It doesn't say that zero is the first natural number, but it says that zero is a natural number. So like po or 2, we need to take its presence as a natural number as an axiom. The first three rules will help to form this pattern. We're going to abbreviate this as PN1 in proofs. He knows 1. Now, the second postulate is that the successor of any natural number is also a natural number. Or, for all natural numbers n, there exists some natural number m such that m is equal to the successor of n. For all natural numbers n, there exists some natural number m, which is the successor of n. It's interesting to look at this rule and ask the question, could we switch those? Does there exist some n, which for all m, m is equal to successor? Of course not. There's not some n which is the comes before all numbers, or at least is the direct successor of all numbers. All right? And also note that we can't say with this that the predecessor of any natural number is also a natural number. We're not saying that the predecessor of 1 must be a natural number because the predecessor of 0 is not a natural number. It's negative 1, and the negative numbers aren't natural numbers, which is what we'll get to with the next postulate. But 
This is the second part of our recursive pattern, basically. It is the then add two to get the next number, or then add po to the end of the string to get the next string. Here we are saying that to get to the next value, you just need to add successorship. In the same way that adding three or pa would break the pattern, if you added something other than successorship, like half successorship, you would not be guaranteed to get a natural number. You might end up with one and a half, which is not a natural number. We'll abbreviate this as PN2 in proofs. Now, talking about predecessorship, and while we're not allowed to say the predecessor of any natural number is also a natural number, we come to postulate number three. It's not the case. There exists some n such that the successor of n is equal to zero. Basically, what we are saying here is there is no natural number which comes before zero. Zero is the first natural number. Before we stated this, while with our first two postulates you could not prove that there was some natural number before zero, you also could not prove that there was not some natural number before zero. We didn't know for sure one way or the other within the system that zero was the first natural number. But now we're able to prove that. Our first postulate made it clear that zero was a natural number, but it did not make it certain that it was the first. This postulate does. It effectively states that the negative numbers are not included in the natural numbers. We're going to abbreviate this as PN3 in proofs. The fourth postulate asserts that for any two natural numbers, if they have the same successor, then they are identical. So for all n and all m, if the successor of m equals the successor of n, so if two particular numbers have the same number that come after it, then n is the same as m. They have to be the same number. No two different numbers have the same successor. Basically, the natural numbers do not branch. There's no branch that comes into the natural numbers and continues along the string. It'd be strange for us to say that bean and three both have the successor of four because the natural numbers are aligned. They don't branch in some way such that we could have bean and three occupying in some way the same spot on the line because four comes directly after them. Now, when we think of natural numbers, we think of things that follow a particular order. No two different numbers can be followed by the same number. Each number has a unique place on the number line. There are no branches, and no two numbers share the same place. Unless they are, of course, the same number. This is defining the very idea of a linear pattern. We're going to abbreviate this as PN4 in proofs. Before we continue to the final axiom, which admittedly is much more complicated, do you think that this implication can be changed into a material equivalence? Or in other words, that the implication goes both ways that if n equals m, that implies that the successor of n equals the successor of m. I want you to try to prove it. You can use this axiom, or any of the rules of predicate calculus that we have so far, or any of the other axioms, particularly applying the rules of identity to natural numbers. And any of the axioms we have listed already. Note that our rules of identity generally quantify specifically over propositions, so in this case, take those rules of identity as also applying to natural numbers as well as propositions. You will need that. Um, just take that universal quantification as over both propositions and natural numbers. Your goal, basically, is to prove for all n and all m, n equals m implies that the successor of m equals the successor of n. So let's take a look. Give it a try on your own first, and then I'll offer the proof. So, we have n equals m as our assumed conditional proof. We're trying to prove a conditional. It makes sense to do an assumed conditional proof. Then, using p note 2, existential instantiation and universal instantiation, we can show that a is equal to the successor of n. All we're doing here is saying that n, whatever number that is, has some successor. We're going to call that a. However, using 1 and 2 and identity, we can say that A is also identical to the successor of M. Therefore, because of identity once again, 
n, the successor of n is equal to the successor of m. So using our conditional proof, we've shown that n equals m implies that the successor of n equals the successor of m. Universal generalization will get us that universally quantified statement, which is the conclusion we were looking for, that n equals m implies that the successor of m equals the successor of n. Whew. Since we've proven both of these implications, we can take, as a rule, the material equivalence that if we have an identity, we can add or take away our successorship operator. Note that this is not the same as the postulate or axiom that we put forward, but rather a rule that we were using because we have proven it as a rule using our other axioms. But we don't need to assume material equivalence. We only need to assume the direct implication. Whew. The fifth postulate is more complicated than the others. It is also known as the principle of mathematical induction. It basically states that for any property, if zero has that property, and for all natural numbers, if a number having that property implies that its successor has that property, then all natural numbers have that property. This is a little more complicated to state since we're going to need to quantify over properties as well as numbers. But before we get into that, let's talk about the word induction. In a number of other videos, I have demonstrated concern with the concept of induction and the idea that simply because the past is a certain way, the future will be a certain way. Do those concerns apply here? Not necessarily, because in this way, we are adding the equivalent of the principle of the uniformity of nature. We're saying that we have proven deductively that if the if a particular number has that property, then its successor must have that property. So it's basically like we've added the requirement that there be what we really need out of induction, a deductive proof that if a certain generalization or rule applies now, that it will apply in the next instant. Because that requirement is present here, this is not in any way going to fall prey to the problem of induction. And the clear demonstration that that property or that requirement is needed for mathematical induction to work is the very indictment of our classical idea of induction. Okay, that tangent is finished, so let's move on and continue talking about this fifth postulate. So this is the way we're going to represent it. Like I said, we don't have a good way of representing kind of second order logic and representing predicates yet, so we're just going to use a as kind of a property. So for all A, if zero has that property A, and for all natural numbers, if a particular number having the property A implies that that number's successor has that property A, then for all natural numbers, all those numbers have that property A. Basically, if the first member of a sequence has a particular property, and for all members of that sequence, if one of them has a particular property, then the following member has that property, then all members of the sequence have that property. To understand this in kind of a more representational form, imagine that you have an infinite row of dominoes. There are two things you need to show to show that all the dominoes will be knocked down. First, you must show that the first domino will be knocked down. Then you must show that each domino will knock down the next. Or in other words, if any particular domino has the property of being knocked over, the domino after it will also have the property of being knocked over. Once you've demonstrated those two claims, then you are able to conclude that all dominoes have the property of being knocked over. Okay? It may seem that this principle is kind of superfluous, that we could use other axioms to demonstrate it in some way, or at least that we could get to all of the basic conclusions without this principle. However, these kinds of patterns are not guaranteed. We cannot prove this axiom with the first four alone. We cannot prove this principle, and yet we need to assume it. Therefore, we're going to abbreviate it, as PN5, and it's going to be used in proofs. It's a little bit strange how it's going to be used in proofs, so 
continue with us through the rest of the video and we will get to a demonstration of how the principle of mathematical induction can be used in a proof. So, before we get to that, we're going to offer some of the axioms around addition and multiplication. So, we're also going to need some axioms which tell us what we can do with our two new operations, addition and multiplication. Each will need two axioms itself. Once again, continuing with our theme of recursion, we're going to define them recursively. So we'll need a specific case starting with zero. How does a number react when it's added to zero or when it's multiplied by zero? And then a rule of how to get to the next step in the pattern, or how to get from a particular number being added to another particular number to the successors being added to each other. The first addition axiom is quite simple. It states that any number plus zero equals the number itself. It is our starting point in recursion. We're going to call it PNZA for Pino Zero Addition. In proofs, that's what we're going to represent it as. Basically, it's going to be for all n, zero plus n equals n. Anyone that has a basic understanding of addition should get why this is an important rule to have. And if you're understanding where we're going with recursion, hopefully you have a sense of why this is something we'll take as an axiom. The second addition axiom is slightly more complicated. It states that for any two numbers, n and m, n plus the successor of m is equal to the successor of n plus m. We'll call this PNSA for Pino Successor Addition in Proofs. Basically, for all n and all m, n plus the successor of m equals the successor of the sum of n plus m. If it's a little confusing, note that there's only, on either side of the equation, there's only one successor, one n, and one m. All right? It might seem unintuitive, but it's going to serve us very well. Notice, as I just said, that both sides of the equal sign are adding three things. They're adding n and m together, and they're adding a successorship. So it's basically the successor of the sum of n plus m on either side, but we're stating it differently. The successorship on the first side is just around m, and on the second side it's around the sum of n plus m. If you don't trust it, take n as 2 and m as 3. The successor of m is 4, so the sum of n and the successor of m is 2 plus 4, or 6 which is equal to the successor of 2 plus 3. 2 plus 3 is 5, and the successor of 5 is 6. Since 6 equals 6, our rule seems to hold up for, basic, for our basic understanding of addition. But note, while we've shown that this rule maps onto what we understand as addition, it doesn't mean that we've proven that 2 plus 4 equals 6 in Pino arithmetic. We just tested to see if the axiom lined up with our understanding of math. But that doesn't mean we can't prove it. Try it on your own. Using only these axioms prove that 2 plus 4 equals 6. If you want to try it on your own, I highly encourage that you do. Pause the video right now. Give it a try. You don't need many mechanics. You're just going to need kind of a basic understanding of the way that these rules and postulates can be applied. If you've already tried it or you just want to see how I'm going to do it, feel free to play the video and let's get started. So first off, we're going to just basically state our Pino's successorship addition rule. Then we're going to universally instantiate it a lot. So we want to figure out what 2 plus 4 equals. So we'll put that as the first side, and we'll say, what does 2 plus 4 equal? Well, it equals the successor of 2 plus 3. Well, we're not really sure what 2 plus 3 equals either, so let's figure it out. We'll instantiate P1 again. 2 plus 3 equals the successor of 2 plus 2. We don't know what 2 plus 2 equals, so we'll instantiate again. 2 plus 2 equals the successor of 2 plus 1. Note that that second term just loses an s each time. It would be faster, probably, if we switched those two terms and were to take the s off the 2 side, but 
this will get us there as well, and it'll demonstrate the principle over and over again, so we get a good sense of it. Now we have 2 plus 1 equals the successor of 2 plus 0. Wait, 2 plus 0, we can't do our successorship trick anymore, we can't remove another s, but we have an axiom to help with that. The 0 axiom claims that any number plus 0 is that number itself. So, universally instantiating it, we get 2 plus 0 equals 2. Because we have an identity claim, we can go ahead and plug that 2 back into our previous equation. We'll plug it in and we'll get the successor of 2 is equal to 2 plus 1. Or the successor of 2, of course, is 3. So, 2 plus 1 equals 3. We've just proved that. But, we're not there yet. We have to take that 2 plus 1 and plug it back in once again to our earlier premise, premise 4, to show that 2 plus 1 just was equal to 3. We plug that 3 in, we get the successor of 3 is equal to 2 plus 2. The successor of 3, of course, is 4. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Plug that in turn back into our previous equation from 3, 8 identity. We'll get 2 plus 3 is equal to the successor of 4, also known as 5. And finally, we will plug that back into that first premise, that premise 2, with premise 9, identity to get 2 plus 4 equals 6. As I said, there's a faster way to do this if you want to reduce the s's on the 2 instead of the 4, but this should be a clear demonstration of the way to use some of these axioms. And we've proven 2 plus 4 equals 6. All right. That seems like a lot of work to prove a very simple axiom. What if we wanted to prove a more general rule about adding 2? Say, 2 plus a number n equals the successor of the successor of n. Or to put it more formally, for all n, the successor of the successor of 0 plus n, or 2 plus n, equals 2 after n, or the successor of the successor of n. How can we do that? Well, in order to do this, we're going to need to use our fifth rule. We will take some n satisfying this formula, making the statement above true, as having the property a. As I noted, we don't have a good mechanics yet to deal with properties and quantifying over formulas, but we're going to kind of fudge it for now until we get some more videos and some more mechanics into second order logic. Basically, think of it like being able to universally instantiate formulas as well as variables. We're going to call it UPI, or Universal Predicate Instantiation. So, we are trying to prove for all m, 2 plus m equals the successor of the successor of m. Give it a try on your own. If you're stuck, come back here and I'll give you a bit of help. So, we can restate our Pino 5, our fifth postulate. And then, here's a little bit of help. Once you have this, I really hope you can move forward. So, this is our universal predicate instantiation of premise 1. So, what we've done is we've replaced that A with this formula. So, in the first part where we had A over 0, or 0 has property A, we've plugged 0 into that formula, into m for that formula. Basically, we've instantiated a as that formula we're looking for in the conclusion. So we've plugged 0 in for m. In the second part, we've plugged in for all n. n has a. We plugged in n for the first part. And then we plugged in s of n all throughout that formula for that second part of that implication in there. And that implies for all m, m has that property a, implies our conclusion, of course, which is that for all m, 2 plus m equals the successor of the successor of m. Now, what we need to do, basically, if you look at the form of that statement, we need to prove the two first parts, the two conjuncts of the conjunction that's in the antecedent of that conditional to use a modus ponens to get directly to the conclusion we want. So, the first part of that conjunction is pretty easy to do. We, in fact, can just universally instantiate our Pino predicate of our zero axiom to get 
SS0 plus 0 or 2 plus 0 equals SS0 or 2. That was just our rule about 0 addition. So we're halfway there. To get the second part of the antecedent of that conditional, we want to do an assumed conditional proof. Note that there's an implication inside this implication. We're saying that if this works for n, it has to work for the successor of n. So 2 plus n equals ssn. Well, using our postulate of successorship in addition, we can then get, well, from that we can show that 2 plus the successor of n equals the successor of 2 plus n. And from identity, we can show that 2 plus n is equal to ssn. And we just bring that s from outside the parentheses back inside to get 3 on that side. So 2 plus the successor of n equals the successor of the successor of the successor of n. Which was what we were trying to prove. That if... 2 plus n equals the successor of the successor of n, then the successor of the successor of 0, or 2 plus the successor of n equals the successor of the successor of the successor of n. Or basically, if this property applies to any natural number, then it applies to the successor of that natural number. We'll then universally generalize this to get that for all natural numbers element of it. We'll conjoin this with our first part, our PNZA from premise 3, and then use modus ponens to prove our result. It's important to look at premise 9 and see how, once again, this is the formula for recursion. We've proven it for 0, and we've proven that for any individual case of a natural number, the following case will also apply. The rule, this formula, will fit any individual number such that as long as it fit the number before it. This is, once again, our two elements of recursion, which have demonstrated that it will work for every single natural number. Which was just the conclusion we were looking for. All right, we are almost done. The last piece we'll need to complete our basic understanding of Peano arithmetic will be the multiplication operation. As with addition, this is going to correspond to our intuitive notion of multiplication. It will also use two axioms, one relating to zero's relation to multiplication and the other relating to how we can build up from that base to other truths of multiplication. So, the first of these axioms relates to multiplication and zero. This axiom claims that any number times zero equals zero. We'll abbreviate this as PNZM. So basically, for all numbers, n, n times zero equals zero. Once again, quite intuitive, right around our understandings of what it means to multiply numbers by zero. The second axiom is that the product of a number n and the successor of another number, m, is equal to the product of those two numbers, n and m, plus the first number, n, for any two numbers. Or more formally, for all n and all m, n times the successor of m equals n times m plus n. This might seem a little confusing, but if we think about it in terms of kind of our visualization of multiplication, it might help out. So imagine that our n times the successor of n. Let's take n as pieces of candy and m as general bags of candy. So we have, let's take n as 2. So we have two pieces of candy in each bag of candy. And m is going to be three bags of candy. So we have n times m is going to be six total pieces of candy. We have two in each bag, and we have three bags. Now let's take the successor of m. The successor of m just means we add another bag. Well, what would we have to add to our product of six if we added another bag? Well, we'd have to add how many pieces of candy are in that bag, which would be another two. So we would add n to the product of n times m. All right. 
Now that you have a basic understanding of Pinot arithmetic, here are several challenges. The first challenge, and the only challenge I'm going to offer a solution to, is for you to discover just how to represent these propositions in Pinot arithmetic. It sounds easy, but it's actually quite difficult. Once you have done that, for an extra challenge that you could offer in the comments below, try to prove them. There exists one number which is equal to 5. That should be pretty simple. Number 2. All natural numbers are multiples of 1. A little bit more complicated. Number 3. It is not the case that all natural numbers are even. And number 4. A difficult challenge. There exists some number which is a power of 3. When I say power of 3, I mean 3, 9, 81, and so on. 27, all of those. Things whose only factors are 1 or another power of 3, basically. Which should give you a hint as to how to prove it. Try those on your own. I'll offer the solutions in a moment. If you want to prove them, I'm not going to offer the solutions here, but I highly encourage you to offer your own solutions in the comments. I'll do my best to check them and see if they check out. So, there exists one number which is equal to 5. There exists some n such that n is equal to s, 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 0, or 5. All natural numbers are multiples of 1. For all n, there exists some m such that s of 0 times m equals n. And in fact, that m is going to be equal to n, but that's not what we're stating. We're saying that there is some number which multiplies by 1 and gives us any n, all n, all right? It is not the case that all natural numbers are even. So it's not the case that for all n, there exists some m such that 2 times that m equals n. Pretty similar formula to the previous one. Now, here's the tricky one. There exists some number which is a power of 3. So there exists some n such that for all n and all a, n times a equals m implies that n equals the successor 0, n equals 1, or there exists some b such that b times 3 equals n. What are we saying here? So there exists some m, some number m. That's the number that is a power of 3, such that for all n and all a, such that n times a equals m. So for all possible factors of m, all possible factor pairs of m, that means for one of those num one of those factors, n, either n is 1, or there exists some b, such that b times 3 equals m, Rem n. Remember that that pattern of there exists some b, such that b times 3 equals n, is just our way of saying that n is a multiple of 3. So basically, for any factor of m, that factor either is 1 or is a multiple of 3. If you want to check this yourself, think about 9. What are the factors of 9? 1, 3, and 9. Well, 1, of course, equals 1, so it satisfied the disjunction that way. 3 doesn't equal 1, but it is a multiple of 3. And 9, of course, itself is a multiple of 3, so that satisfies it. But you look at something like 6, 6 has the factors 1, 2, 3, and 6. Now, while 3 of those factors satisfy the disjunction, 1 is equal to 1, 3 is a multiple of 3, and 6 is a multiple of 3, there's 1 that does not. And because we've universally quantified it, we're saying that for all factors of 6, they must satisfy one of these things. And 2 does not equal 1, and it is not equal to or there does not exist some b such that b times 3 equals 2. So 6 is going to be disqualified, which is exactly what we wanted. All right. This video is already quite long, so I won't do the proofs of these statements here. If you think you have the right answer, please offer them in the comments below. If you're feeling especially clever, try this puzzle proposed by, by Douglas Hofstadter. This is extra, extra bonus, extra credit. If you can do this and offer it in the comments below, I will be overjoyed and amazed, and maybe even, if I find the time and I'm able to do it, show your proof in a future video, because this is really tough. You don't even have to prove it. I just want you to represent this statement. There exists 
some natural number, which is a power, excuse me, that's incorrect on the screen, a power of 10. Okay, next up, we're going to be looking at axiomatic theories of truth with trimodal logic and Saul Kripke. We may split those two concepts up, look at axiomatic theories, and then look at trimodal logic and Saul Kripke. I'm not sure, but stay tuned for the next video in our series, You Can't Handle the Truth. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.